So, uh, after these fantastic lectures on varied clinical presentations and management protocols, amazing management protocols in AVN, I'll be talking briefly on the basic science aspect of AVN. Because the gross pathology of bone in AVN is well known, well documented, and also well classified. But that is the effect. We really don't know exactly what is the cause at the basic science level. There have been some studies related to that, looking for those causes, but you know, it is so multifactorial that there are so many causes that there is no correlation. It's very difficult to correlate that to in a disease which has so many different types of pathologies. So I'll be just briefly touching, it's a research project we took about three years back with our brothers in uh, University Shri Satyasai Institute of Higher Learning, which has a fantastic biosciences department. So we have the gross pathology, but the gains is a question mark. We have uh, Dr. Sain and Dr. Golhar and Dr. Magu giving extremely good results, long-term good results, but very few patients present so early to give those good results. You know, the patients we get are already into the collapse stage. So we really, really want to know what led to that collapse, what, what led to that effect in the, bone, in the bone, where that bone pathology started, when and how it started. That's what we started to look in. So this was our project, avascular necrosis of femoral head, head a biophysical biochemical and histopathologic characterization and correlation. Very ambitious project we took. We really, uh, believe me, we, we didn't know what conclusions we'll get. We gave it as a PhD project and we just prayed to Swami and yes, with Swami's grace, we got some fantastic conclusions. We have already submitted this to one of the journals in the Nature Group and it's under consideration. I'll just briefly present my unpublished data, which we got. So we identified the problem areas, everybody knows that. So there is no early diagnostic marker, we all know that. Current medication regimes do not successfully hamper the progression of disease. So can we find out a unique biomarker which can help to diagnose the disease early? Or to diagnose the disease, in the predisposed population early on. Based on these markers, can we alter the current medication regime and see the halting of the progression of disease? That will be the thing which will come later. This is too early to comment on that, but these are our, <coughs> these are our uh, results we got. So we did the root cause analysis. The root cause was sluggish capillary flow, all know that, thrombosis hypoxia. These are the factors which are the gray area, unknown, all multifactorial, genetics, really don't know. Environmental, lot of things, mutations. What are those mutations? It is so varied. You'll be surprised to know there's so many papers, so many publications, different mutations, but nothing correlates. Biochemical, what is the, what is the pathology at the biochemical level? and the deficiencies, largely neglected. What deficiencies in natural diet we eat can lead to AVN? Or, I, I take my hands up, not lead to, at least can predispose to AVN. We had a set of uh, research questions we made. Is homocysteine or metabolites involved in homocysteine pathway are associated with AVN? That is our first research question. The second one, what is the mechanism? What is the mechanism by which homocysteine influence osteoblast-mediated osteoclastogenesis? Very strange. This is mediated by an osteoblast and leads to osteoclastogenesis. I'll, see, I'll show that. That is in a cell line called raw cells, a murine cell line. What is the mechanism by which hypoxia induces osteoclast differentiation? Again, this is also very interesting. Does hypoxia or metabolites from homocysteine pathway augment platelet degradation on treatment with ADP? That is another research question. We are still working on that. 
the platelet aggregation aggregation data will come in the next one month what are the biophysical histopathologic and ultra structural changes in femoral head so we did a raman spectroscopic analysis we did histopathology we did a scanning electron microscopy and then we try to correlate this is known fact a path all the pathways in avascular necrosis a big confusion here but we must understand this is instrumental homocysteine this is the this takes the center stage and i will show you how again the acetaldehyde pathway has been very well uh, studied again even in this pathway homocysteine takes the center stage there are other factors acetaldehyde can directly lead to hypoxia and other things but homocysteine has the center stage different types of avn again whether a steroid induced post traumatic idiopathic in our setup most of the avns were idiopathic we had about 20% of 25% of alcohol induced 20% of steroid and post traumatic also about 20% but 40% close to 40% were idiopathic avns and i really cannot answer that question that some of those avns were dr sain some of some of those avns were really fulminant you know progressing very rapidly within 3 years and leading to big collapse so this is what we got we we got with when we did the metabolomics in the metabolomics we got homocysteine very high in the homocysteine pathway we got homocysteine in plasma of avn patients statistically significantly high we got all the metabolites in the homocysteine pathway statistically significantly high we got vitamin b12 vitamin b6 and b10 deficiency statistically significant in all the avn plasmas we got urea polyamine pathway all the metabolites raised in avn again statistically significant against spermin but we have not studied uh, spermin so far in detail so in this analysis most of our most of our plasma increase in homocysteine and homocysteine pathway and the metabolites of urea pathway are all statistically significant we came to this chart where we see that you can see that these are the patients so we see how homocysteine this is the increase this disease portion in the disease in the healthy the blue is the healthy so you see the the uh, you see the it is so less but in the disease part in the plasma it becomes deep red the homocysteine is very high very highly statistically significant then we went on to the clinical parameters sodium we didn't really look for sodium but we got it sodium was high in all these patients statistically significant all of these patients of avn had anemia and majority of those were macrocytic anemia creatinine high in all the avn patients so these were our clinical parameters sodium showing high statistically significant in this case hemoglobin again low highly statistically significant macrocytic anemia so this was clinical parameters metabolomics then we went on to the biophysical this all the studies are going on side by side so biophysical and microscopy study every avian case i would make axial sections and then we will preserve in the, uh, preserve and then take it for different analysis so like this one this for example we did the we have the correlation with the mris where exactly the lesion is and so this like this case these sections were then subjected to mass spectroscopy that's called raman spectrometry so that's like a molecular fingerprinting i'll show you that it's very interesting so micro raman raman spectroscopy we did for each sliver in the avn and then the controls and then compared so we see here there will be 18 spots along the cross sectional area so those 18 spots will be like a normal near diseased diseased 
again near diseased, again normal. This is how we will see what are the changes at molecular level happening at that particular point. So a laser shot will be given at that particular point and we will get these graphs. So we will see what is the phosphate amide ratio, carbonate peak, carbonate amide. So mineralization changes at, at those particular points. So these 18, 18 points, so we see different types of presentations at different areas. What we found was carbonate amide ratio was statistically less, statistically significant. It was less in the avian patients, it was all less. Phosphate amide was less. The carbonate peak we see was less. Then the changes in the bone parameters, the same, the carbonate amide, phosphate amide, and the carbonate peak. The scanning electron microscopy, this is the normal bone, the control sample, what we see. Then we see large lacunas, la large lacunas, the necrotic bone everywhere. And then, surprisingly, many of these bones were attempting to heal. The healing potential was still there. It was still there at the margins. The same thing we could corroborate in the histopathology. We saw the cement lines. The cement lines are the, uh, the characteristic of the healing potential at the side of the uh, necrotic areas. Then we went on to the cell culture models. What we took was an osteoblast cell line and a raw, that is the murine macrophage cell line. We treated the osteoblast solution with homocysteine and we took the supernatant and put it in the raw cell line, that is the macrophages. What happens really is the osteoblast was not affected at all by homocysteine. It remained the same. In the alzheimer stain, osteoblasts blast remained the same. No change. But what happened was they released Rankel. Rankel is a receptor analog. It's a receptor ligand. So it released Rankel, which converted a macrophage into an osteoclast. So it led, led eventually to an osteoclastogenesis. So an osteoblast is making osteoclast, is actually facilitating making of osteoclast. So in the presence of homocysteine. So this is what it shows how we see an osteoclast making up. I'll just show you, yeah, here. Big one. You see here the control sample. This is the osteoclast on the raw, raw cells. Then, so what happens is rankle is released from osteoblast being treated by homocysteine and that rankle eventually converts, it converts the macrophage into an osteoclast. That's what is happening. Not to end that, we went to gene expression studies and we did uh, the gene expression is still on, actually it's still on. We are still working on the hypoxia mechanism. We are working on the platelet aggregation. We still, we are working on the gene expression further. So P2X7 was 3.5 times expressed in all these patients. So this is what is right now what we have with us. We had some single nucleotide polymorphisms. We found five SNPs which are significant to AVN, but we need to corroborate that with the population because we need to see what really it means. This is in brief, uh, the clinical chemistry data meaning done in so many patients control AVN metabolomics and again the Raman microspectroscopy scanning electron microscopy in histopathology. So this all we have all discussed. But then the thing is, there is a big potential. There is a big potential of prevention of disease or at least arresting the disease at an early stage. Our conclusions, elevated homocysteine and right now, because this is unpublished data which has been submitted, so elevated homocysteine and its metabolites in plasma of avian patients is statistically high. Elevated metabolites of polyamine and urea, pathol uh, urea pathway, again statistically significant. This is important, reduced vitamin B12, I don't know sir, but more, all the patients had reduced vitamin B12, vitamin B6, and B10. If the population is not deficient in vitamin B12, can we say that we are protected from avian? I don't know, but yes, it definitely can be a predisposing factor. 
This can become a basis for a large epidemiological study in selective populations for identification of high-risk individuals for avian. Homocysteine induces P2X7 inflammatory cytokines in higher gene expression. Then conditioned medium from homocysteine treated osteoblast induced osteoclast formation. We are still studying it and we have extended our study. Maybe in the next two years we'll have some more good conclusions. So this can pave the way for new drug trials which inhibit homocysteine pathway. If we inhibit homocysteine pathway, can we prevent avian? That's a big question mark. And bone remodeling is altered. We all know that. It's indicated by Raman microspectroscopy and decreased phosphate to amide and carbonate to amide ratio. Reduced thickness of trabecular bone. Histo this all is uh, the gross pathology which we know. So this can be helpful for thorough understanding of the matrix mineralization at different areas during mass spectrometry. See, because it is the non-disease area, close to disease, disease, again close to disease, and then we really know what exactly at the molecular level is happening there. We hope that we extend this study and eventually can unravel some more mysteries of avian in near future. Many thanks for the kind attention. Gosh, I think uh, this is the way to go. Maybe we'll be able to solve something and bring Lawrence to your institution and uh, to me also. Uh, any, 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 any questions? I think uh, are they in order? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Uh, I, I think definitely there is nothing which really makes uh, any words to uh, get into for this kind of a study. It's wonderful. I'm very, very happy. Thank you so much. Very, Thank very so happy. Much. Staying on the clinical side of it, we started looking for not to the level which we have gone to. When we say idiopathic, we tend to say these all things are not there. The question comes when somebody is alcoholic, he just takes one once a month. Do we label him at alcoholic induced or we don't label him? Correct. Likewise, somebody has taken steroid just one a tablet because we see that the dose is a very important factor. So taking a tablet or two tablet or five tablet, does it make him steroid induced or doesn't make it? When you started looking at the epidemiology, we had epidemiology of about 700 cases when we looked at the avian as such. So it became a very difficult question for us to also. Then I looked into the histopathological people. I asked them, do you have a selective criteria in the histopathology where you can label it that it had come from a, a steroid or it had come from alcohol side? At that point, I'm talking about way back in 2004 and 5 when I was working on it. They said we don't have any histopathological characterization that it is coming from uh, this thing or it is coming from that side. Correct. But eventually I found subsequently in the histopathology, just like about a month back I was reading one of the reviews on avian, they said that probably the histology, now you can make those differentiation because many things have developed in the histology sites also. But that was one thing. Second, now when you look at the homocysteine, and when you look at the samples at the time, the, a question arises, are they a cause or they are effect? That, that is there. Then, again, in that way, I don't know, working on that because once I had a project on the experimental part on the avian also, there could be a very simple, which I was just thinking at that stage that we can go in experimentally induced things, uh, starting from, let's say, it can be a steroid induced avian in an experimental situation and watch on its homocysteine level subsequently, whether they get those values accordingly before the avian starts. Right. Or they right. Don't. Probably right. we may be able to link in that way also, the importance of homocysteine. Importance, right. Then we'll know that exactly, exactly yes, whether it is a cause or it's the effect true, of these true, things. Yes. So there are very good questions which come out of your this work. I'm, I have really to congratulate you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Great work. Thank you, Dr. Prakash, and thank you, Dr. Sain. And uh, I think we'll close this session and.